east wind blows up Helford River, small waves beat angrily on the sandy shores. The gulls wheel and cry above the foam, their grey feathers glistening with salt spray. Once the river belonged to the gulls, the curlew and redshank, guillemot and puffin. Once, on a map of Cornwall faded and yellow, someone scratched the name of a narrow inlet, its short twisting course running westward into the valley. Frenchman's Creek. Look now. A figure stands by the river in the moonlight, the cold light glinting on his buckled shoes and the cutlass in his hands. A woman stands by his side, a cloak round her shoulders, her dark ringlets drawn back behind her ears. A forgotten century peers out of dust and cobwebs. Frenchman's Creek by Daphne du Maurier, dramatized by Micheline Wando. With Lorna Heilbronn as Donna St. Colum, Struan Roger as Jean, Michael Tudor Barnes as William, Michael Cochran as Harry, Norman Bird as Lord Godolphin, and Christopher Godwin as Rockingham. Frenchman's Creek. We're going to the play. Oh, Lord, must we? We always go to the play on Friday. Rockingham will be there. I say, those rubies look beautiful on you. Please, Harry. Oh, you look good enough to eat. Mm. Please, you'll spoil my dress. Oh, can't you keep the dogs quiet, Harry? Hey, uh, Duke, uh, Duchess, here, here, have some chocolate. They will leave marks everywhere. Oh, I don't care. At least they love me. Oh, damn it, Donna. Don't let's go to the play. Hang Rockingham, hang the world! Why the devil don't we stay at home, eh? No, no, if we are due to go to the play, we must go. Oh, very well. I wish you'd make up your mind. Come along, Duke. And you, Duchess, come on. Come on, here, boy. Here, 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 boy. Take this with you. Here, there we My dear, you look absolutely divine. And you, Rockingham, look absolutely drunk. <laughs> no more than your husband. May I sit next to you at dinner? Can I stop you? Ah, the only wife amongst a crowd of mistresses. You're honoured to sit cheek by jowl with the ladies of the town at the Swan. Mm, no, you cannot stop me. <laughs> I can stop you putting your hand on my knee. <laughs> Remove it, please. You like it. I shall tell Harry. <laughs> I'll tell him myself. I say, I say, old boy. Rocky, oh, my friend. Your wife has a very fine knee, old fellow. <laughs> Aren't you angry, Harry? Rockingham, you are very amusing. <laughs> oh, really? Have you told Harry about our little prank, my dear Donna? What? Uh, what prank? Hampton Court. Rockingham? <laughs> Last week when you were indisposed, Harry... Drunk, Rockingham. We rode to Hampton Court by moonlight. Donna dressed up in a pair of my breeches. We played at footpads, didn't we, Donna? We halted a carriage and forced an old woman to step down on the highway. Your young wife called out a hundred guineas or your honour. And the Countess, poor wretch, 60 if she were a day, gave us her sovereigns, terrified that this young rip from the town might throw her down into the ditch. Don't worry, Harry. I handed her back the purse and we rode back to town. <laughs> what on earth possessed you to dress up in Rockingham's breeches? Ah. Was there a masquerade? I mean, well, why didn't you take me? <laughs> a prank. It was a prank I played out of boredom. She made a delightful young highwayman. Oh, I don't understand either of you. <laughs> Come on, I'm hungry. After you, Lady St. Colum. Oh. Are you tired, Donna? I am tired, Harry. 
I'm very bored. Well, I'll soon stop you being bored, my darling. Come here. Please, Harry. Oh, go on, Donna. No, I want to talk to you. Oh, very well, then. But hurry up. You know I hate talking. I've had a most unpleasant evening. Huh? I hated the stupid play. I hated the silly audience shouting and throwing orange peel onto the stage. I hated... Oh, very well, my love. We shan't go to the play next week. Harry, why did you marry me? What on earth are you talking about? Here I am with two children, and next month I will be 30. Well, I don't mind that. I hate myself. Oh, you are I... not to blame. Nor our senseless life, nor the foolish escapades, nor our friends. It's my fault. No. I want excitement and love and danger. And here I am, shut up in a musty house with stinking gutters outside in noisy, intolerable London. Well, why didn't you say? We'll, 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 we'll go to Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll pack up and go to Hampshire. There. Now, may we go to bed? I want yeah. to smell the sea. Oh. I want to breathe. I want to go to Cornwall, to Navron. Well, very well. We'll go to Navron. I'll send word that the house is to be open, the servant's ready now. Donna, my love. I am at some kind of crisis in my life, Harry. I must go through it alone, without you. But, damn it, Donna, you can't leave me. I must. If, but what have I done? What have I said? I can't explain. Well, why don't you want me to come with you? I must be alone. Otherwise, I shall drive us both mad. Oh, God, I don't understand. Do you remember my father's aviary in Hampshire? One day, I set a linnet free, and it flew straight out of my hands towards the sun. Well, what of it? I feel like that. Like the linnet before it flew. Oh, I really can't follow you, my dear. No, I don't expect you can. <laughs> you look so sad in that white nightshirt, Harry. You poor dear. Go to bed now. Oh. Helen, damnation, Donna. Why must you be so confounded tricky? Apple blossom and gorse and the smell of moss from the moor. No more stupid pranks at Hampton Court. We'll dip our hands in the sea and not mind being soaked with a spray. No more pretense. Seabirds will scream at us, herons and curlews and gulls. Three hundred miles away from the smells in the hay market and Rockingham's odious smile and Harry's yawn and his blue reproachful eyes. Apple blossom and gorse. No more boredom, no more stupidity, no more pretense. Just apple blossom and gorse and the sea. I'm hungry, Mama. Not long now, Henrietta. Where are we going, Mama? We are going home, darling. But where? Why must we drive? It will be a new home, a much nicer home. You'll be able to run in the woods and dirty your clothes, and Prue will not scold you because it doesn't matter. But I don't want to dirty my clothes. I want to go home. Do you think they will have aired the house, my lady? I don't know, Prue. I suppose we'll have damp beds and closed shutters. But there will be apple blossom and gorse and the smell of moss from the moors and the sea. We'll dip our hands in the water and become soaked with the spray. Fishes will jump out of the water and seabirds will scream at us. <laughs> Are there gardens at Navron, madam? I suppose so. I only visited it once, just after we were married. I think there were trees and a river and great windows that peered from a long room. I can't remember any more. Just one endless business of sofas and sickness and smelling bottles. Mama! Mama! I'm hungry! We will stop and eat. Crew, we'll spread the rugs beneath the hedge and have a picnic. Shall we, children? Yes. yes. But, my lady, the ground may be damp. Nonsense, Prue. We're hungry. Well, how shall I bathe the children's hands and faces? Never mind that today. I have some ale in the basket, Henrietta. Can I have some ale, Mama? Yes, and so shall James. We shall have a picnic. Driver, stop the coach. room smells like a tomb. I don't think it has been aired for a long time, my lady. There is dust everywhere. As your ladyship never came to Navron, it scarcely seemed worth my while to see that the rooms were clean. The idle mistress makes the idle servant. I did not say so, my lady. No, you did not. Please see that every room in the house is swept and dusted, the silver cleaned and flowers placed in every room, 
just as though the mistress of the house has been in residence here for many years. It will be my personal pleasure, my lady. I do hope you are not laughing at me, William. No, my lady. The gardeners have done their work at least. The grass is fresh trimmed and all the hedges clipped. And there, there is the river, shining and soundless, the sun dappling green and gold. William, is there a boat? Uh, well, my lady, the spring tides are due. Uh... Well, we shall see. I don't remember you, William. You were not here when we came before. Uh, no, my lady. I remember an old man. He had rheumatism and could hardly walk. Where is he now? In his grave, my lady. I see. And you replaced him? Yes, my lady. You have a strange accent. I will try to speak clearly, my lady. Oh, I can understand it well enough. Sir Harry and I thought that Navram was fully staffed. Well, it seemed to me, my lady, possibly wrongly, that one idle servant was sufficient. For the past year, I have lived here entirely alone. I could dismiss you for that. Yes, my lady. I might do so in the morning. Yes, my lady. But supposing I do not dismiss you, William, what then? I will serve you faithfully. How can I be sure of that? I have always served faithfully the people I love and respect, my lady. Now you are laughing at me. Still, you have spirit. I think you do too, my lady. Tomorrow I want fresh flowers everywhere and all the windows open wide. Very well, my lady. Tonight I shall eat late. I shall sit alone at the head of this long table with candles everywhere. I have a fancy for grapes, black and succulent, with the bloom on them. Oh, Dusty. Yes, my lady. I will cut you a bunch with a pair of silver scissors. How quiet it is. A full moon. The smell of lilac. Henrietta looked like a waxen doll with her curls falling about her face, her mouth slightly pouted. James just looked chubby and truculent in his sleep, like a little pug dog. Such pretty children. <sighs> what on earth? That's not lilac. It's harsh. It stings. It... Good Lord. Tobacco. A jar of tobacco. Strong, freshly cut. William? Surely not. Sleeping in my bed, smoking, looking at my portrait. And a book of French poetry. Ronsard. J.B.A. Finisterre. Tiny drawing of a gull. Well, well, well. Everywhere. Catch me, Mama! Catch me! Henrietta, I am tired. I must sit down. Lord Godolphin <laughs> is here to see you, my lady. Who? Lord Godolphin, your neighbour. Um, there is a piece of honeysuckle behind your ear, my lady. Oh, damn. Henrietta, run along and find James. William will take you. Uh, here he is. This way, Henrietta. Good afternoon, ladies and Colin. You must excuse me, Lord Godolphin. I have been playing with the children. I am enchanted to see you, of course. I heard you were in residence, and I thought it my duty to pay my respects. My wife would have accompanied me, but she does not enjoy very good health at the moment. She is... Uh... <clears throat> I quite understand. We hope for an heir. Of course. And when is Harry coming? I knew him very well when he lived here as a boy, you know. Indeed. I'm sorry to say, Harry will not be coming. That is a pity. I was hoping he might assist us. You have heard of our troubles, no doubt? Troubles? No. Oh, well, perhaps you are too remote here. We have been vexed and harried almost to our wit's end. 
with acts of piracy. How intriguing. Goods of considerable value have been lost along the coast. My neighbour, Lord Penrose, was robbed only last week. How distressing. It is more than distressing. It is a positive outrage. This damned Frenchman is like the plague. Frenchman? Uh, yes. This fellow's a low, sneaking foreigner who knows our coast like the back of his hand and slips away before we can lay our hands on him. His craft is like quicksilver. He creeps into our harbours at night, lands silently, like the stealthy rat he is, seizes our goods and is away on the morning tide while our fellows are rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. In fact, he is too clever for you. Uh, uh, yes, madam, if you like to put it that way. We landowners will have to band ourselves together and deal with the menace. Is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> My dear lady, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. Except ask your husband to come down and rally round his friends so that we can fight this damned Frenchman. I'm afraid Harry would never catch him. He is far too lazy. Perhaps you do not realize how serious the matter is. Our women folk sleep in terror of their lives. <laughs> and not only their lives. Is he that sort of pirate? This fellow is a Frenchman. It is only a question of time before something dastardly occurs. Oh, quite. Surely it must be possible to lay some trap for this foreigner. A ship is not a phantom thing. It depends on wind and tides. Men are not soundless. Their feet must echo on the keys. Their voices must fall in the air. This is not a matter for a lady to worry about. I suppose not. Well, I, uh, I must go now. When you next send messages to your husband, I trust you will give him some account of our troubles? Yes, of course. William! There's no need to show me out, your ladyship. Oh, very well. Good day, Lord Godolphin. I shall call upon your wife. Uh, good day, Lady St. Colum. William, in future I will not be at home to call us. I will be out walking or asleep, ill or mad even, confined to my room in chains. I have come to Navron to avoid people, William. Yes, my lady. It shall not occur again. You shall enjoy your solitude and make good your escape. Escape? Yes, my lady. I had gathered that you are a fugitive from your London self, and Navron is your sanctuary. You have uncanny intuition, William. Many of my ideas and much of my philosophy are borrowed from my former master. I have made a practice of observing people, even as he does, and I rather think that he would term your ladyship's arrival here as an escape. Why did you leave your master, William? At the moment, my lady, my services are of little use to him. We decided I would do better elsewhere. So you came to Navron? Yes, my lady. Do you like poetry, William? <laughs> you must have gathered I am not a reader, my lady. The books here are coated with dust. Uh, tomorrow I will take them all down and dust them. You have no hobby, then? I have quite a fine collection of moths, my lady. The woods round Navron are excellent for the moths. So Navron is an escape for you, too? Possibly, my lady. And your former master, what does he do with himself? He travels, my lady. Then he also, William, is a fugitive. Indeed. I may say his life is one continual escape. How pleasant for him. The rest of us can only run away from time to time. And however much we pretend to be free, we know it is only for a little while. Just so, my lady. I should like to meet your master, William. I think you would have much in common, my lady. Perhaps I will modify my command about visitors, William. Should your former master call, I will not feign madness or illness or any other disease. I will receive him. Very good, my lady. And now I have a great desire to walk along the river. There is the river. Wide and shining as it meets the sea. The sea is still, calm. In the distance, sea and sky meet at the horizon. A smudge. 
the white sails of a ship. No breath of wind upon the water. The ship hangs between sea and sky like a painted toy. A high poop deck and curious raking masts. A crowd of gulls clusters round the ship, wheeling and crying and diving to the water. Here comes the breeze. The waves ruffle out across the sea. And now the sails catch the breeze and fill, bellowing in the wind, white, lovely and free. The gulls rise in a mass, wheeling above the mast, and the setting sun catches the painted ship in a gleam of gold. Oh, I shall always remember this. Dear Harry, one Godolphin called upon me. I found him ill-favoured and pompous with a growth on the end of his nose. His wife is expecting a baby, at which I express sympathy. He was in a great fuss about a pirate, a Frenchman, who comes by night and robs his house. I propose setting forth myself with a cutlass between my teeth. When I have entrapped the rogue, who, according to Godolphin, is a very fierce fellow indeed, a slayer of men and a ravisher of women, I will bind him with strong cords and send him to you as a present. <sighs> oh, dear. What's that? William, meeting a man by the trees in the moonlight. He's pointing towards the house. The stranger shrugs his shoulders spreads his hands, and they both withdraw into the belt of trees and disappear. Collecting moths in the woods? I wonder. Amuse yourself as you wish, Harry, and think of your figure when you take that fifth glass. Today I walked along the river. Tomorrow I shall visit the sea for the first time. Your affectionate wife, Donna. You wish to see me, my lady? After lunch, William, I would like you to take some flowers to Lady Godolphin. Today, my lady? If you please, William. Uh, I believe the groom is doing nothing, my lady. I wish the groom to take Miss Henrietta and Master James and the nurse for a picnic in the carriage. Very well, my lady. Tell one of the maids to turn back my bed and draw the curtains. I shall rest this afternoon. Yes, my lady. Butterflies, warm air, drowsy bees, the glimmer of water, the stealthy branch of the parent river creeping into the woods, an enchantment, a new escape, a lotus land. The heron stands in the shallows, solemn and grey, his head sunk into his hooded shoulders, Beyond him, an oyster catcher and a curlew. Navarin is a place to drowse, a place to escape. Water oozing away from the mud flats, the creek, still and soundless, hidden from everyone. The creek widens, opening out into a pool, and... Oh, there it is. The painted ship I saw before, here at anchor. The painted ship, red and golden in the setting sun. On the quay, tackle, blocks and ropes. It must be very deep water where the ship lies, for the tide froths and bubbles away. They seem to be making some repairs. There is a boat tied alongside. No one would ever know that a ship lies at anchor in this pool, shrouded by the trees and hidden from the open river. La Mouette. The ship's name written with a flourish in gold letters on her side. La Mouette. I wonder what 
that means. I should go back to the house. Pretend I've never seen the ship. Forget about it. Godolphin and his turnip friends can put up with it. The county can suffer. I do not care. <gasps> what have we here, then? <gasps> Let me go! Oh, oh, go! Come on. If you won't walk, oh. I shall have to carry you. Oh. You're not very heavy. If you promise not to shout, I'll take this coat off your head. Do you promise? Promise! There we are. Thank God. How dare you! Well, well. Let me go at once. Oh, not quite yet. I must see what I have snared. Let go! I do not want to hurt you. I shall shout for help. There is no one to hear you. That is better. You will not get away with this. Oh, but I will. I always do. Where are you taking me? To my ship, where I can entertain you without fear that you will fly away. You are mad. Indeed. Who are you? My name, madame, is Jean Benoit Aubary, at your service. Perhaps you do not know who I am. Oh, but I do. Welcome to La Mouette. Lady Donna Saint Colombe. You look surprised, Lady Saint Colombe. It's like a room in a house with chairs and paintings of birds everywhere. I can smell soup. You thought we pirates would be desperate creatures with rings in our ears and knives between our teeth. We're just ordinary men, you know. We scrub the decks and we cook vegetable soup, that is all. It seems you've been spying on my ship. On the contrary, it seems your men have been trespassing on my land. Oh, my very humble apologies. I had not expected the lady of the manor to visit me in person. As a rule, we have no trouble. You have been more bold than most. You are not hurt, are you? No, but I am not used to being treated in such a manner. It will do you no harm. What damned insolence. What do you propose to do with me? Ah, there you have me. I must look up my book of rules. Excuse me. Yes, prisoners, method of capture, questioning, detainment. Yes, it is all here. But unfortunately, these notes relate to the capture and treatment of male prisoners and... I have no arrangements to deal with females. It really is most remiss of me. <laughs> yeah, that is better. Anger does not become the Lady saint Coulomb, the spoiled darling of the court, the Lady Donna who drinks in the London taverns with her husband's friends. You are quite a celebrity. How do you know? I have ears. That's finished. Over and done with. Uh, for the time being. Forever. These drawings, are they yours? Yes. This heron is always on the mud by the head of the creek when the tide ebbs. It is one of his feeding grounds. I saw an oyster catcher on the river, and another bird, a curlew, I think. Yes, they would be there too. The night jars are farther down the creek. They are so wary, though, it is almost impossible to get really close. I've never heard a nightjar. You must know the creek very well. It is my refuge. I come here to do nothing. And commit acts of piracy against my countrymen. And commit acts of piracy against your countrymen. <laughs> you like the drawings? <laughs> they are beautiful. So many gulls. They have a fellow feeling for the ship. That is why she is called La Mouette. Ah, oh, La Mouette, the seagull, of course. Why are you a pirate? Why do you ride spirited horses? Because of the danger, because of the speed, because I might fall. That is why I'm a pirate. Yes. It is simple. I have no grudge against society, no bitter hatred of my fellow men. It just happens that piracy suits my inclinations. It is not all brutality and bloodshed. 
It takes many hours of organization. Every detail of a landing has to be thought out and prepared. I hate disorder. It is a geometrical problem, food for the brain. Do you mind if I smoke? Of course not. Good Lord. What is the matter? A tobacco jar, a, a volume of French poetry, the drawing of a seagull on a title page, William running to the belt of trees. Well, well. All these months while I was in London, you have been sleeping in my bed at Navron. How very remiss of William not to have noticed that I left my tobacco and my book in your bedroom. In the winter, it can be very damp in the creek. It made a luxurious change to seek the comfort of your bedroom. I consulted your portrait. My lady, I said, would you grant a very weary Frenchman the courtesy of your bed? And it seemed to me that you bowed gracefully and gave permission. Sometimes you even smiled. It was very wrong of you. Very irregular. I know. Besides being dangerous. Ah, that was the fun of it. If I had known... What would you have done? I should have dismissed William and set a watch on the estate. When I lay in your bed, looking up at your portrait, that was not how you behaved. How did I behave? You joined my ship's company. You signed your name amongst the faithful. You were the first and the last woman to do so. Here, in this book. Take the quill. Think of your husband in London, yawning over his cards. Think of Lord Godolphin, who has visited you. Think of the good soup you can smell. The wine I shall offer you. No. No. What is the time? The children will have returned from their picnic. They will be calling for me. You are free to go and to return. The creek is yours. The ship is yours. You are one of us. Will you sign? Oh, this is madness. I must go. Very well. And is Navron House to be barred and bolted? Is William to be dismissed? No, of course not. I must return your call, then, as a matter of courtesy. What is the correct hour? In the afternoon, I believe, between three and four. Pirates do not call upon ladies in the afternoon. They come stealthily at night, knocking upon a window. The lady of the manor, fearful of her safety, gives him supper by candlelight. Tomorrow, then, at ten o'clock. You wish to see me, my lady? Yes, William. I'm giving a small supper party late tomorrow night. Very well, my lady. How many will you be? Only two. Myself and one other. A gentleman. Yes, my lady. You need not mention the visit to anyone in the house, William. You are dreadfully shocked. Oh, nothing you or my master ever did could possibly shock me, my lady. <laughs> Oh, my solemn William, you have guessed. Your eyes are, if I may say so, without giving offence, my lady, very much alive. I've always known that sooner or later you would meet. Although I am a lady of the manor, married and respectable, with two children, and your master a lawless Frenchman and a pirate... Perhaps because of all those things, my lady. Do you approve of your master's profession, William? A pirate is a rebel and an outcast. Piracy suits my master. His ship is his kingdom, and no man can command him. But piracy is wrong. He robs those who can afford to be robbed, my lady. The poorer people in Brittany often benefit. The moral issue does not concern him. If I were a man, William, I would find my ship and go forth, a law unto myself. Now, what shall we eat? Crab, dressed and prepared in the French fashion. Small new potatoes cooked in their skins. A fresh green salad sprinkled with garlic, with tiny scarlet radishes, and thin narrow wafers interlaced with cream with the first wild strawberries of the year. Will that do, my lady? Oh, yes, William. Here he comes, across the lawn. 
His long coat is wine-coloured, and his sash is the same. There is lace at his throat and at his wrists. The moonlight touches his white stockings and glimmers on his silver buckled shoes. You may smoke. Here. Oh, my tobacco, thank you. When I came here in the winter, the covers shrouded the furniture and there were no flowers. William cooked me a chop and served it on a chipped plate and told me I must be content. The house looks very different now. I hope it is to your taste. I shall take you fishing and roast your catch on a fire. You will have to eat it with your fingers. I shall look forward to that. When did you become a pirate? Once there was a man called Jean Benoit Aubary who had estates in Brittany, money, friends, responsibilities, and a servant called William. William's master became weary of Jean Benoit Aubry, and so he turned into a pirate and built La Mouette. Is it really possible to become someone else? I found it so. Are you happy? I am content. What is the difference? Contentment is when mind and body work in harmony. Happiness is more elusive. It approaches ecstasy and comes perhaps once in a lifetime. There is another kind of happiness in the pleasure I have when I've made a drawing and it has the shape and form I wanted. It is easier for a man. His happiness comes in the things he makes with his hands, with his brains, with his talents. But women have babies. That is a greater achievement. I mean, you have children, have you not? Yes, too. When you held them for the first time, did you not say to yourself, this is something I have done myself? Was that not near to happiness? Perhaps. May I uh, draw you? Now? Yes. Uh, no, 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 don't move. The uh, portrait of you upstairs, uh, when was that painted? Soon after I became betrothed to Harry. How long have you been married? Seven years. Henrietta is six. What decided you upon marriage? Harry was amusing, and I liked his eyes. He drank too much on our wedding night. I started Henrietta almost immediately. I was entirely unlike myself, not being able to ride, walk, or, or do all the things I wanted to do. I couldn't explain to Harry. I still don't understand why you are a pirate and rob Cornishmen and make Cornish women go in fear of more than their lives. The Cornish women flatter themselves. Frenchmen have a reputation for gallantry which is entirely without foundation. We are shyer than you give us credit for. Here. I finished your portrait. It is only a sketch. What do you think? You have made me appear older than I am. Possibly. There is something petulant about the mouth. I dare say. And a curious frown between the brows. Yes. It is someone whose illusions have been lost. Someone who looks out upon the world from too narrow a casement, finding it bitter and a little worthless. I don't think I like it very much. I apologize. It was an unpardonable thing to do. You told me yesterday that I had been trespassing on your land. It is a fault of mine in more ways than one. If I drew you at another time playing with your children, for example, or on my ship, the drawing would be entirely different. Then you might accuse me of flattering you. Forgive me. The truth is, I was ashamed because someone else had seen me as I too often see myself. Supposing the artist bears a similar blemish himself, need the, the sitter feel ashamed? You mean there would be a bond between them? Exactly. The east wind is blowing and my ship will be weather-bound. Perhaps you will visit me and let me draw you again. Or well, do not forget, you still have to sign your name in my book. I shall not forget. Ah. Thank you for my supper. Good night. Good night. Hmm. 
It is rather warm in here, but uh, because of Lady Godolphin's condition, I have commanded that the windows be shut. <laughs> Would you like another piece of cake? No, thank you, Lord Godolphin. Do you not miss life at court, Lady St. Column? Not at all, Lady Godolphin. And the pleasures of the king? <sighs> it is a great pity that Navron is so isolated. If only we were all a little nearer to you, we could meet more often. You show remarkable courage living there, all alone. You are, I trust, amply protected. You have servants you can trust. Implicitly. Oh. Godolphin has told you, I think, how we are menaced from the sea. By an elusive Frenchman. Yes, Lord Penrose. Who may not remain elusive very much longer. Indeed. The authorities are of no help. We shall deal with the foreigner ourselves. Providing enough of us join together. What exactly is your plan of capture? It is as yet in embryo, madam. But I would warn you that we suspect some of the country people in the district to be in the Frenchman's pay. You astound me. We believe the Frenchman has a hiding place along the coast. Have you not made a thorough search? My dear Lady St. Colum, we are forever combing the district. But the fellow is as slippery as an eel, and he appears to know our coast better than we do ourselves. You have, I suppose, seen nothing of a suspicious nature around Navron. Any strange craft entering or leaving the estuary? No, nothing whatever. I have no wish to alarm you, but he is the type of man who would have little respect for your person. You mean he is quite unscrupulous? I fear so. And his men are most desperate and savage. They are pirates, madam, and Frenchmen at that. Oh, no. Are they, do you think, cannibals also? My baby son is only just three. <laughs> Calm yourself, Lucy. Lady St. Colum's jesting. The matter is not to be treated with levity, Lady St. Colum. Forgive me. I shall bar and bolt my house. And with neighbours such as yourselves and the Penroses, I am sure no harm can come to me. When I catch the Frenchman, it will be my very special pleasure to hang him from the tallest tree in Godolphin's Park just before sundown. Sir, you are very bloodthirsty. So would you be, madam, if you had been robbed of your silver and plate. Think what joy you will have replacing them. I fear I consider the matter in a very different light. I must say that Harry's presence in the neighbourhood would be of enormous assistance. Once he knows that piracy is rampant on the coast... I have oh. already mentioned it to him. Were I in his shoes, I would never have permitted you to travel west alone. Women without their husbands have been known to lose their heads. Only their heads? <clears throat> if you came face to face with a pirate, I dare say you would shiver and swoon like the rest of your sex. It looks as if some women in the hamlet hereabouts have suffered at the hands of these damned scoundrels. <laughs> you may find they did not suffer at all, but on the contrary enjoyed themselves immensely. I do think, Lord Godolphin, you should not distress your dear wife with such talk. How long has your master been anchored in the creek, William? Uh, about a month, my lady. What is his usual visit? Five or six days, my lady. I see. It is rather strange that before I came to Navron, I thought very little about birds and even less of fishing. It is rather strange, my lady. I suppose the desire to know about these things is always lying dormant. Indeed. Uh, your old gown is behind the cushion, my lady. Thank you. Do you think me mad, William? Shall we say, not entirely sane, my lady? I shall be in the avenue shortly after ten o'clock, William. You will drive me to the house as though we were just returning from Lord Godolphin's. Yes, my lady. What are you smiling at? I was not aware, my lady, that my features were in any way relaxed. Hand me that stone. This one? Yes, thank you. Now, we fasten it to a long length of rope, throw it overboard, and we shall come to anchor. Down the ebbing tide come little wisps of grass, a fallen leaf or two. The thin, wet line between my fingers pulls gently. I examine the hook. A dark ribbon of seaweed clings to the end of the line. You are letting it touch the bottom. Are you tired of fishing? I was thinking. They were all gloating over your capture this afternoon. <laughs> that does not worry me. Penrose is not a pompous dunderhead like a dolphin. 
He means to hang you from the tallest tree in Godolphin's Park. That is a compliment. You think that, like all women, I am afire with rumours and gossip. Like all women, you dramatise events. And you ignore them. What would you have me do? Be cautious. Penrose said that the country people know you have a hiding place. Did they uh, tell you how they proposed to capture me? No. Neither shall I tell you how I propose to evade them. Do you think for one moment I should... I believe you have a fish on your line. Uh, give it to me. I can do it myself. Oh, the, the line is tangled. Gently now. Bring him to the side of the boat. No, no, no. Don't pull quite so hard. There now. Gently. I have done it. Oh, poor thing. He is dying. I am hurting him. What shall I do? This. You have killed him. Of course. He is close to me. His hands are beside my hands. I want him closer still, with his lips touching mine and his hands beneath my back. Are you hungry? Yes. I'll row us to land. Oh, listen. The night jar. The golden lights of evening have gone, and the sky is paler now. There is a smell of moss about the air, and the bitter tang of bluebells in the wood. At the entrance to the creek, where the trees crowd to the water's edge, we climb ashore. I find dry twigs. I break them across my knee. My dress is torn and crumpled, and I wish Lord Godolphin and his lady wife could see me now. The sticks crackle and flare. The trees throw long shadows down to the quay. The fish roasts in the fire. We look at one another across the flames. There is a radiance in the deepening sky that belongs only to a midsummer night. Uh, you'll have to eat the fish with your fingers and drink the wine from the bottle. Not like suppers at the Swan in London. What do you know of my suppers at the Swan? The Lady St. Colomb sups cheek by jowl with the ladies of the town and later roisters about highways like a boy, returning home as the night watchman seeks his bed. You think this is a brief interlude in a series of escapades? I did not say that. You think I am a spoiled whore lusting after new sensations without even a whore's excuse of poverty. I wish I was back at Navron with James staggering on fat, unsteady legs. I can pick him up in my arms and hold him tight and bury my face in his smooth, fat neck and forget this new anguish that fills my heart. Are you not thirsty? No. In the winter, when I used to lie in your room at Navron, I made my own pictures of you in my mind. I would see you fishing or watching the sea from the decks of La Mouette. Somehow... The pictures would not fit with the servant's gossip. How unwise of you to make pictures of someone you had never seen. How unwise of you to leave your portrait in your bedroom untended and alone with a pirate landing on the English coast. You might have turned it with its face to the wall or even put another in its place. The true Donna St. Colum roistering at the swan and dressing up in the breeches of her husband's friends. You should have been born a boy. You are an outlaw at heart. Dressing up in breeches and frightening old women was the nearest thing to piracy you could imagine. Or oh, you do not care for killing fishes, either. You are mocking me. When I was a boy, to make my soldiering more realistic, I would paint my hands red and pretend to be wounded. But when I saw blood on a dog that was dying, I ran away and was sick. And now you are a pirate, and fighting is your life, robbing and killing and hurting. On the contrary. I am often very frightened. Yes, but not in the same way. Not frightened of yourself. No, 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 no. That has gone forever. Your friends, Penrose and Godolphin, shall have a run for their money. You are going to do something dangerous? Risk capture and possibly death? Yes. Why? Because I want the satisfaction of proving to myself that my brain is better than theirs. That is a ridiculous reason. It is my reason, nevertheless. It is an egotistical thing to say, a sublime form of conceit. It would be wiser to sail back to Brittany. Far wiser. La Mouette may be wrecked instead of lying peacefully at anchor in a port across the channel. La Mouette was not built to lie peacefully in a port. If, um, you were a boy, 
You could come with me. But then women who are afraid of killing fishes are too delicate and precious for pirate ships. Do you really believe that? You would be seasick. Nonsense. You would be cold, uncomfortable, and frightened. <laughs> you would beg me to put you ashore just as my plans were about to work. How much will you wager? Ah. Well, it depends on what we have to offer each other. My necklace. You can have my ruby necklace, the one I wore when you visited me at Navron. Now, that would be a prize indeed. There would be little excuse for piracy if I possessed that. And if I win, I want a lock from Godolphin's wig. You shall have the wig itself. Very good. Then we need discuss the matter no further. When do we sail? When the ship is ready. The fire is low. It is getting late. William will be waiting with the carriage. I trust you enjoyed your dinner with Lord Godolphin. Very much indeed. And the fish was not too indifferently cooked. The fish was delicious. You will lose your appetite when you go to sea. Sea air will make me ravenous. We shall have to sail with the wind and the tide. It will mean leaving before dawn. The best time of day. I shall be ready when you send for me. All the restless devils inside me are appeased. I've fallen under a spell which echoes within me, as though I've come to a place I've already known and deeply desired, but have lost through my own carelessness or circumstance. As I come out into the avenue, under the tall beech trees, the branches stir softly, like a whisper of things to come. Lady, wake up. What? Monsieur has sent word. The ship sails within the hour. What time is it? A quarter to four, my lady. Oh, I must hurry. I will supervise the house in your absence, my lady, and see that Prue does not neglect the children. I have every confidence in you, William. You may frown upon Miss Henrietta if she talks too much. Yes, my lady. And should Master James very much desire a second helping of strawberries... I am to give them to him, my lady. When Prue is not looking... Do you wish you were coming with me? <laughs> Unfortunately, my lady, I possess an interior that does not take kindly to the motion of the ship upon the waters. I have a wager with your master that I shall not succumb. Do you think I shall win? It depends upon what your ladyship is alluding to. That I shall not succumb to the motion of the ship, of course. William, you are very French in your ideas. Forgive me, my lady. Yes, I think you will win your wager. It is the only wager we have, William. Indeed, my lady. Look, the sun is rising. You must go. I shall announce to the household this morning that your ladyship is indisposed, a trifle feverish, and that for fear of infection, you would prefer that no one came to your room but myself. Excellent, William. You are, if I may say so, a born deceiver. Uh, women have occasionally informed me so, my lady. <laughs> I believe you to be heartless, William. Are you sure I can trust you all alone amongst a pack of scatterbrained females? I will be a father to them, my lady. Goodbye then, William. Look after them for me. As I climb the ladder to the high poop deck, I can see the ship is ready for sea, the decks clear, the men standing at their appointed places. I hear the rattle of the cable in the hawser, the grind of the capstan and the stamping of feet. Ready ahead! This is a different man from my companion of the river, who built a wood fire on the quay and cooked fish, his sleeves rolled above his elbows, his hair falling into his eyes. Slowly the wind fills the great sails. The ship creeps down the creek like a ghost, now and again brushing the trees. And now the wide parent river opens up before us, and the wind comes full and true from the west, sending a ripple on the surface. La Mouette meets the strength of it, healing slightly her decks aslant, a little whipping spray over the bulwark. Dawn is breaking, and the sky has a dull haze and a glow that promises fine weather. 
There was a salty tang in the air, a freshness from the open sea beyond the estuary. Do you like it? Of course I like it. And I am filled with a great ecstasy, for I know that he is mine and I love him. I am part of his body and part of his mind. We belong to each other, wanderers, fugitives, cast in the same mold. I think this ship is bewitched. That is the effect she first had upon me. And you do not feel sick. I have never felt better. Would you like to sail the ship? I? Sail the ship? Of course. Oh, what do I do? Uh, hold the spokes in your two hands and keep her steady on her course. I, I can't see what I'm doing. The wind is blowing my hair over my eyes. I'll hold your ringlets back. There. Thank you. Do you know what Lady St. Column is doing now? I should love to know. She is lying in bed with a feverish chill, and she will receive no one in her room except William, her faithful servant, who now and again brings her grapes to soothe her fever. If Lady St. Column tosses on a bed of fever, who is this woman steering my ship? She is a cabin boy, the most insignificant member of your crew. My cabin boy? is not at all suitably dressed. We must find you some clothes. What about the wheel? The ship can take care of herself. This is her weather. She will keep to her course all day with a finger to the wheel now and again. One of the men is about your size. He has a pair of breeches. He keeps the saint's days and confession. They should be clean enough. He can lend you a shirt, too, and stockings and shoes. Shall I cut off my hair with a pair of scissors? You would look more like a cabin boy, perhaps. But I would rather risk capture than have you do it. I feel marvelously free without petticoats and ribbons. How do I look? Wonderful. Now I can see the Lady San Colomb who masqueraded as a highwayman in London. Tell me where we are going. We are bound for Foy Haven. Now, here is a plan of the harbor. The main anchorage is there, in deep water opposite the town. And there is a fort at the entrance to the haven and two castles, one on either side of the channel. These will not be guarded. This is where we shall be lying, a mile or so to the east of the haven. We shall go ashore here on this beach. There is a rough path up to the cliff, and then we strike inshore and come to a creek. At the entrance to the creek, moored to a buoy, we shall find Lord Penrose's ship, the Merry Fortune. Ah. Now, this ship has come from the Indies. My intention is to seize her as she lies at anchor, put some of my crew on board, and have them sail her to the French coast. But suppose her men outnumber yours? Ah, that is one of the risks I take. The essential thing is the element of surprise. You can wait for us here. Oh, no. I shall come with you. Ah, good. For I still have our wager. Our wager? Yes. Surely you haven't forgotten. You told me you wanted Lord Godolphin's wig. I am a gentleman. I always honor my wages. night is dark and still. A small breeze comes from the north. La Mouette lies at anchor on the fringe of a bay, close to great cliffs, shadowy and indistinct in the darkness. There's something eerie in the stillness, something strange, as though we have come unwittingly to a land of sleep. These cliffs tonight are a hostile place. I am in enemy territory. For the first time since I arrived on board, I have a sudden chill of fear. If the plan fails and we are captured, 
Harry will probably blow his brains out. The children will be orphaned, forbidden to speak their mother's name. A woman who ran away after a French pirate, like a kitchen maid after a groom. Give me your hand. The men will spread out across country and we shall meet at Lord Penrose's ship. Look, you can still see La Mouette. There is a riding light high in the rigging. Oh, yes. She looks so far away. The wind is back to the southwest. You can smell it. A tangy, wet smell. Uh, the tide will be our only ally, for the wind has changed sides and become a hostile force. Donna. Yes, sure. The weather is going to play us false. It is raining already. You still have time to return to the ship. I'm not going back. Not now. Why do you want to stay? You know why I want to stay. I want you to go back for the same reason. Oh, stay then. And we will make a fight of it and hang together from the same tree, you and I. Now then, we shall have to persuade Lord Penrose to board his ship. He will be less danger to us there than raising the devil ashore and sending a cannonball across our bows as we pass the fort. Would you like to do something with a spice of danger in it? Yes. Tell me. I want you to go and call on Lord Penrose. You can't mistake his house. It is hard by the church facing the quay. You can see it from here. There's a light upon it now. I can see it. Go and tell him that his presence is urgently required aboard his ship. Make up any story you like. Play any part you have a fancy for, but keep in the shadow. You are possible enough for a cabin boy in darkness, but uh, a woman under the light. Suppose he refuses to come. He will not refuse, not if you are clever. And if he suspects me and keeps me there? I shall deal with him. I shall be waiting for you in a boat by the quay when your mission is accomplished. Go now. A house standing alone in the street by the side of the hill. A light in the lower casement, glowing through the drawn curtains. The street is deserted. There's a gale blowing up from the southwest, Penrose. Lord Godolphin. It's a pity you did not moor the ship up the river. They may have trouble with her in the morning if this weather continues. Godolphin here, within three feet of me, dropping the ash from his disgusting pipe onto my shoulder. Shaw's mad. He's planned not only to capture the ship, but to seize Godolphin's wig. Open up there. Who's there? Lord Penrose is wanted. The master is anxious to move the ship now before the gale worsens. What is it? Come inside, boy. No, sir. I'm wet to the skin. Sir, the master says there is no time to lose. The ship is in danger. What is wrong with the ship? I must go, sir. Make haste. The gale is freshening. A man stands on the quay. It must be the night watchman. What if the boarding of the ship has not gone according to plan? What if the resistance has been stronger than they expected and they are fighting now on the decks of Penrose's ship? I say there, the night watchman! Hey, you fellow! Hide! Hide! Yes, sir? Have you seen a lad run this way? I've seen no one, but there's something amiss yonder, sir. Looks as though your vessel has broken from the boy. What's that? Then the lad did not lie after all. Thank goodness for that. Look, sir, they're getting sail on her. The master must be going to take her upriver. The fellow's crazy. There are not a dozen men on board. They'll have her gone before they're finished. We must get all hands on her. Ring the alarm bell. Right away, sir. Ahoy there, Mary Fortune. Ahoy! Get me a boat. Come on, man. A boat. She's helpless. The tide's taking her to the rocks. They must be mad aboard or get drunk. Hurry up with that boat. Someone's been missing with a rope. It's been cut. Then swim, swim and bring me a boat. By God, I'll frass the fellow who played the trick. I'll have him hanged. See the men at the yards, the great topsail shaking out. The sail is drawing taut. Ahoy there! Ahoy! He's crazy! He's making for the harbour mouth! Three boats out in a line abreast, with a warp from the ship to each of them, and every man in them bent double to his oars. The topsail fills and pools, and the ship heels to a great puff of wind. He's going to sea. By God, he's taking her to sea! One the soldiers at the fort! I must get back to shore. Leave that boy! The keys to rain for all this! Catch him! Catch that boy! Go back, I say! 
I must warn Shaw that the alarm has been sent to the fort. My hair has come loose. I can't see. The wind is whipping my eyes. Oh, rocks, wet, slippery. Blood on my hands. Blood on my face. The wind has shifted. Ah, oh, the Merry Fortune is sailing seaward. Nothing matters now. I don't even care if Godolphin recognize me. The Merry Fortune is sailing away. Donna! Sure. I'm over here! Oh. Oh. oh! You are hurt, Donna. It is nothing. The soldiers in the fort. Hurry. We must row out to the ship. Come on. Catch the rope, Donna. I have it. Nearly there. Oh. You have a cut on your chin, Joe. You have a cut on your chin, too. Get down. Oh. Shot us full and short. Save your powder, boys. You'll not catch us this time. There's your friend down in that boat. Do you know if he shoots straight? I doubt it very much. There's a woman aboard. Look there. Greetings to you, gentlemen. And a safe passage back to Foyki. Before you leave, however, we would like something to remember you by. Excuse me, gentlemen. Now, my Lord Godolphin, you will pardon me if I knock your hat into the water. It is your great curled periwig which attracts me. See how neatly it fits the point of my sword. God damn it! Oh, oh, oh. Thank you and farewell! His head was as bald as a naked baby. Well, my lady Saint Colomb, and what about our wager? You have won the wager, Monsieur Jean. Oh. What is it? I feel terribly sick. Oh. Yes, yes, please do. How do you feel? I am better. What is the time? Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. What day is it? Sunday. Your friend Godolphin will have missed his morning in church unless there is a good barber in Foy. Look. <laughs> Godolphin's curled periwig. <laughs> It's all coming back to me. I was terribly sick. Oh, I have seen far worse. Here, some bread and cheese. Can you eat? Oh, I'm starving. Oh, my clothes. Where are my clothes? Uh, they're being washed. Uh, drape the blanket around your shoulders. Oh, no, 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 wait. You forgot the Merry Fortune has been to the Indies. Ah, here. Scarlet, gold, and a silver fringe. Perhaps Godolphin had this shawl in mind for his wife. I think that we might have been hanging from a tree in Godolphin's Park. Hmm. What are we going to do now? Oh, I never make plans on a Sunday. Have some wine. Do you always have the devil's own luck, Frenchman? Always. Where are the crew? Oh, we bound them back to back, gagged them, cast them adrift in a boat. No one was hurt. Oh. I am glad it is over. I enjoyed the danger, but I do not want to do it again. I thought my heart would burst. You did not do too badly for a cabin boy. How long shall we stay on the Merry Fortune? Why? Do you want to go home? No. I just wondered. I'll leave a handful of men to take the Merry Fortune into a port in Brittany, and then we shall return to England on board La Mouette. Then where do we go? Well, back to Helford, of course. Do you not want to see your children? Oh, yes, I do. Of course I do. But I don't want to leave the ship. I cannot get up until my clothes are dry. No. How long will they take to dry in the sun? Oh, uh, at least three hours. Perhaps you should lower a boat and send someone to La Moette for my gown. Everyone is asleep. 
Don't you know that Frenchmen like to be idle between one and five in the afternoon? In England, people never sleep in the afternoon. Then I shall follow your custom. After you have paid me your debt. My debt? Oh, surely you have not forgotten. I must remind you, my Lady saint Colomb, that you lost a wager. I know. I succumbed to the sea. You must pay your forfeit now. Must I? You owe me your ruby necklace. No, 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 do not give it to me. I shall take it for myself. Do you know what day it is? Sunday. You told me. Midsummer's Day. The longest day of the year. Come closer. <sighs> sun shining on my head, the spray blowing on the deck, the warm, pungent odour of tar and rope and blue salt water, the feel of his back against mine all night. This is our day, our moment. This ship is so easy to steer. Look, you can see the coast of Cornwall in the distance. This could be tomorrow and the next day and a year ahead. In other countries, on other rivers. And what about Donna San Colomb? Perhaps at this very moment she is walking in the bedroom at Navron with her fever gone, remembering only very faintly a dream she has had. She has not woken yet, and her dreams are of a loveliness that she never knew before. Now, for all that, they are still dreams. And in the morning, she will wake. No, just this, the ship... The surge of water, the taste of the sea, and your hand here against my heart. Donna, I could sail away now in La Mouette and come back in 20 years' time. And what should I find? A placid, comfortable woman with her dreams long forgotten. And I myself, a weather-beaten mariner, bearded, stiff in the joints, my taste for piracy gone. My Frenchman paints a dismal picture of the future. Your Frenchman is a realist. And if I sailed with you now and never returned to Navron? Who can tell? Regret, perhaps? Disillusion? Not with you. Never with you. Well, then, perhaps no regrets. But more nests and more broods, and I would sail alone again. You see, Donna, there is no escape for a woman. Only for a night and a day. You are right. There is no escape for a woman. So if I sail with you again, I shall be cabin boy and wear breeches once and for always... You can make your landings on the coast, and I, the humble cabin boy, will prepare your meals, and I'll ask no questions and refrain from touching you. Oh, how long will you be content with that? For as long as we please. We wouldn't last a single hour. I suppose I must return to Navron. And then? If all is well with the children, I will return to the creek. We shall breakfast together, and then we'll go fishing. We'll swim at noon when the sun is hottest on the water. And the heron will come down to feed with the turn of the tide, so you can draw him again. And where will the Lady saint Colomb be? Lying in her great canopy bed in London, restless and lonely, knowing nothing of this she belongs to yesterday. There is a mist upon the water. I shall put on my gown. I wrap my cloak about me, and once more I am Donna St. Colum. And my cabin boy? Your cabin boy is sulking and impatient until the day he can sail with you again. Goodbye, my Frenchman. Hurry back, Donna, as soon as you can. And somewhere, too, there is a donor of tomorrow, 
a donor of the future, of ten years away, to whom all this will be a thing to cherish, a thing to remember. Much will be forgotten then, perhaps. The sound of the tide on the mud flats, the dark sky, the dark water, the shiver of trees behind us, and the shadows they cast before them, and the smell of the young bracken and moss, and of the sea. Even the things we said will be forgotten, the touch of hands, the warmth, the loveliness, but never the peace that we have given to each other, never the stillness and the silence.